Hello everyone, my name is uh, Jolt Molnar and I would like to thank um, the organizers for inviting me to give this lecture on how to interpret procalcitonin at the bedside in COVID-19 patients. Well, regarding my disclosures, uh, in addition to my two academic affiliations, I'm also one of the medical directors for Cytosolvent. So to start off with, uh, I would like to give a short uh, background how PCT comes in the picture of COVID-19. Well, if you look at the uh, first reports from China and we observe the trajectory of the patients, both survivors and non-survivors, then we can see that these patients are admitted to the hospital with fever, cough, and then they spend a few days on, uh, on the wards and then they some of them are admitted to uh, develop dyspnea and then they are admitted to the intensive care unit, invasively uh, ventilated, some of them, both survivors and non-survivors, and some of them will develop secondary infections and then uh, some of them also die. So we face two problems here and we need to identify patients who are admitted with viral infection and with bacterial infection at the beginning, but we also need to identify those who develop a co-infection later on. So this is one of the um, potential purposes why we need to measure biomarkers in procalcitonin. The other one is the host response. Host response means an, means an immune response to an insult, which can be damage or pathogen associated, as we all know. Now, if uh, we receive an insult, then the immune response activates itself. Fundamentally, both the innate and the adaptive immune uh, response increases its activity, as you can see on this very nice figure. And the role of the innate immune response is to produce pro-inflammation and uh, eliminate the debris or the invaders. And the role of the adaptive is the pro-anti-inflammatory force to counteract this and keep it under control. Now, if we are healthy, as you can see here, then after five, six days, our immune system conquers the disease and we recover. However, in a certain group of patients, this well-controlled scenario goes out of hand and at the initial phase, pro-inflammation overwhelms anti-inflammation and these case, patients can die due to overwhelming inflammation. In the old days, we called this fulminant septic shock. Now we know that this is basically a cytokine storm, a dysregulated immune response or whatever. So um, this is an important issue in viral infections as well. Uh, hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis, which is uh, a very um, important uh, asset in viral infections as well, as you can see, 30% of patients in this German registry develop this um, HLH syndrome, which is a cytokine release syndrome, a hyperinflammatory syndrome, due to viral infections. Almost one third of patients develop that. So it can also be an important issue to detect and monitor dysregulated inflammatory response in these patients, for which purpose procalcitonin can also be used. So let's start with the infection. Why is diagnosing infection important? Because if there is bacterial infection or bacterial co-infection, you may consider that this patient needs antibiotics. But if there is no bacterial infection in that patient, then I would not recommend uh, anybody to give antibiotics to their patients because antibiotics are not without harm. They can have several very important side effects. And as you saw it on my first slide, that these patients can develop later uh, during the course of their disease, bacterial co-infection. And if you treated these patients for two weeks with unnecessary antibiotics, they can develop multi-drug resistant train related infections. How can we diagnose infection at the bedside? Well, clinical signs are very important. They lead us towards the source of the infection, but we all agree that it's just not good enough. This is why we use physical and laboratory markers signals. However, the conventional ones like fever, leukocytosis, just to name two of those, are more or less useless in the critical care setting. It's been shown already in uh, 1985, and then we have also published this, that these are not any better than flipping a coin. And uh, if it's head, the patient has infection. If it's still, the patient doesn't have infection. So what we have 
is also microbiology. This is very important. It can tell you the name, um, uh, the susceptibility of uh, the um, pathogen. However, we receive the results pretty late, at least after 24 hours taking the samples. And also, 20-30% uh, of the cases, uh, this can be false negative or false positive. This is why we use biomarkers to help us to make decisions. Unfortunately, these are called sepsis biomarkers, which is not really true because these should be called inflammatory biomarkers because the same biomarkers can be released after trauma, major surgery, as, uh, as after bacterial, viral or fungal infections. There are loads of them, more than 200 uh, now, and that was when the, this, publication, this publication was released in 2010. You can take your pick, whatever you use, any biomarker may be useful. Undoubtedly, I, um, I've been using PCT for more than 20 years, 22 years now, and um, we have uh, also um, published uh, several articles. I will show you a couple of them at, towards the end of my presentation. However, regardless whichever biomarker you use, applying them and interpreting them at the bedside is not easy. Now, what do we know about PCT and viral pneumonia in general? There are several publications starting from the H1N1 epidemic, SARS, MERS, and so forth. And you can see it on this figure that within the first one or two days, there is clear distinction. Patients with viral pneumonia, pure viral pneumonia, they have very low PCT levels. Those who have bacterial pneumonia, they have higher PCT levels. And those who have mixture of uh, viral and bacteria, they have also statistically significant higher levels of, uh, of procalcitonin. However, when you look at the error bars, there is huge overlap, and we will discuss it a bit further in the next slide. In this um, community-acquired pneumonia study on several hundreds of patients, there is again a clear distinction. A significantly higher PCT levels were found in patients with typical bacterial pneumonia as compared to those who had pure viral pneumonia. And this uh, had an area on the curve of about 73% to predict whether the uh, infection, the pneumonia is viral or non-viral. The lower the PCT, the higher the sensitivity for viral pneumonia. And on the contrary, the higher the PCT, then uh, the higher the specificity, or in other words, the higher the chance that the pneumonia is bacterial and not viral. However, when again you look at the figure, you can see that there is a huge overlap. So this patient here has a very high PCT value with viral pneumonia, and this patient here, is a, he has a very low um, PCT level, although with typical bacterial pneumonia. This is why the authors concluded that no procalcitonin threshold perfectly discriminated between viral and bacterial, but higher the procalcitonin, the greater the chance that the probability of bacterial pathogens are present. Some authors uh, also suggest to use cutoff values, like uh, Ruskanen and co-workers in this study. They suggested that if the PCT level is below 0.1, then it suggests viral cause, while it is above 0.5, then it suggests bacterial cause. You can see that there is a gray zone between these two values, so it is still not uh, clear-cut. And uh, they also propose that no clinical algorithm exists to discern, discern clearly the cause of pneumonia. Nevertheless, we have further studies showing that uh, viral-only pneumonia patients, uh, they have pretty low PCT level as compared to bacterial patients with bacterial co-infection. And they found a different uh, cutoff value or threshold. It was 0 0.8 nanogram per milliliter with a pretty good area on the curve to predict bacterial, the presence of bacterial co-infection or not. And in fact, the ruling out role of PCT was emphasized in this study. What they found that when there was low PCT and the absence of alveolar consolidation, then the odds ratio was 13 for no co-infection, a pretty high uh, odds ratio uh, to ruling out um, bacterial co-infection in these patients. So what do we know about uh, PCT and COVID-19 patients? Well, one thing has been shown by several studies, and this is a recent meta-analysis, that the higher the PCT, then uh, the higher the risk for, uh, for further organ dysfunction and the more severe 
uh, outcome of the disease than when the PCT is low. So it has a prognostic uh, value for sure. And they propose the cutoff value of the, the usual convention, 0.5 nanogram per milliliter. What about putting it in the context of other diagnostic tools? Um, chest radiography, chest CT scans, as you can see it in this nice uh, study also from China, they were positive uh, in more than 50% of the chest radiograph was positive and um, uh, chest CT more than 80% in patients who were admitted with COVID-19. However, these patients belong to the low severity and no adverse outcome groups of patients. So these patients were not that sick, but they had a very high percentage of positive alteration on the radiographical uh, images. Same true for uh, CRP. Uh, 50-80% of patients who were low disease, had lower disease severity, no adverse outcome, they had high CRP values, while PCT was only elevated in less than 4% of these patients. So if you want to use chest radiography or CRP to detect uh, bacterial complications, they cannot help you in this scenario because it will be positive almost in all patients. However, again, another study showing that um, uh, procalcitonin in levels can indicate uh, risk severity and adverse outcome in these patients. Another study showing that procalcitonin is uh, only increased in a minor proportion of patients, 6% in this patient cohort. However, interleukin-6, almost in every other patient, and um, CRP, 86% of the patients was found to be elevated. And interestingly, only 1% of bacterial co-infection was detected in this patient cohort. However, 71% of patients received antibiotic treatment. As I said, only 1% uh, had proven bacterial co-infection. Only 4% had to be ventilated uh, by mechanical ventilation. 23% was admitted to the ICU, but we don't have uh, data on this uh, regarding PCT. So I have some doubts that it is a very high percentage of antibiotic administration when we have such a low degree of bacterial co-infection. So I have doubts that this decision was the right one. And that is just reinforced by the fact that 4% of the patients developed fungal co-infection. And we all know that, that the irresponsible antibiotic administration is responsible for multi-resistant drug strains in hospitals and invasive fungal infections. Another study showing that majority of patients, especially those who do not require ICU admission, they have very low, less than 0.1 PCT. And those patients who are admitted eventually to the ICU, they had 25% on admission higher PCT levels, while patients who did not require ICU admission, none of them had higher PCT than 0.5. And uh, in this small, relatively small patient cohort, three patient, four patients developed uh, bacterial co-infection, and three out of them had elevated PCT, which was low on admission, and they jumped up to these values you can see here. So there is some suggestion that if we look at the change in PCT, it may be useful. And this is two of our recent studies in which we <clears throat> showed the value of procalcitonin kinetics. In the first study, we looked at the change of PCT within 24 hours. We suspected infection in these patients here, and we had PCT from the day before. These patients were all in the ICU. And those who did not develop eventually infection, infection was not proven, their PCT was low and remained low. But those patients in whom infection was proven, they basically doubled their procalcitonin values. So it shows that if you detect an increase in your patients who are admitted with COVID-19 to your ICU and you measure it daily, then look around, check whether there is infection or not. And in this study, we just emphasize the importance of procalcitonin kinetics. We measured procalcitonin eight hourly after we started empirical antibiotic treatment. And you can see a clear and significant difference between patients who received inappropriate antibiotics and those who received appropriate antibiotics. I have no time to go into depth of this study. Just one thing to conclude in this regard, that if you do measure your procalcitonin daily, evaluating the change, the kinetics, can have 
very high added value in addition to the absolute values. What do we learn from recommendations? Regarding the um, surviving sepsis campaign, COVID-19 adopted a very recent guideline. Uh, they do recommend uh, to use uh, empirical antibiotics in mechanically ventilated patients with weak recommendation and low quality of evidence. I disagree with this comment based on all the previous slides I told you. A more recent um, clinical experience based UK uh, recommendation um, suggests that antibiotic usage should be judicious they highlight the importance that we shouldn't give antibiotic routinely to every patient. And um, they recommend the use of procalcitonin to monitor for bacterial infection, co-infection and restarting antibiotics as required. And it is very important that they suggest PCT as a stop signal. Now, uh, they also uh, draw the attention that false negative PCT seems less um, of a problem and low PCT may be more helpful to um, rule out um, the need for antibiotic uh, administration. And also the um, International Federation of Clinical Chemistry suggests that procalcitonin which increases then it may uh, suggest the bacterial superinfection and they also recommend the routine use of procalcitonin in these patients. So in summary I do believe that monitoring procalcitonin in these patients should be a daily routine. Low PCT uh, indicates low severity, low likelihood of bacterial co-infection, and it can be a good stop signal to stop uh, antibiotics once you commence them. Increasing PCT by evaluating kinetics can help identifying superinfection and can have added value. And in general, Using this kind of approach uh, can help you to rationalize and individualize your antibiotic treatment in COVID-19 patients. Thank you very much.